Esther from Once Upon a Crime. I am thrilled to have been invited to participate in the Generation Y podcast 10-year podversary live show. Join me in helping Justin and Aaron celebrate their 10 years producing one of the best and longest-running true crime podcasts ever. The live show will take place on September 8th at the Screenland Theater in Kansas City, Missouri, or you can also participate by live stream. Tickets are available at genypod.com. Along with Justin and Aaron, special guests include Nick and the Captain from True Crime Garage, Charlie from Crime Lines, Bob Ruff from Truth and Justice, Josh from True Crime BS, and me. It's going to be epic, and you won't want to miss it if you're as big a fan of Gen Y as I am. They were actually my biggest inspiration for and for supporters of Once Upon a Crime. Once again, get your tickets for the live show or live stream at genypod.com, and I hope to see you there. This podcast details true crime cases. It contains adult themes and may contain descriptions of violence. It is not intended for children. Listener discretion is advised. Thank you for joining me for today's episode of Once Upon a Crime. This month I'm detailing stories of some of the most badass female outlaws of the Old West. I believe I've saved the wildest woman in this series for last. Kitty Leroy was one of a kind. Because of her beauty and vitality, she was admired by many. Because of her quick temper and skill with weapons, she was feared by more. It is said that Kitty had five husbands, seven revolvers, a dozen bowie knives, and always went armed to the teeth. From Texas to California to Dakota Territory, Kitty's name was well known in her day but her legend has all but been forgotten. In this episode, I'll share the story of Miss Kitty Leroy, a woman who ran with other legends of the Old West like Wyatt Earp and Calamity Jane, but whose name you may not have heard before today. This is the last chapter in the series, Wild Women. much is known about Kitty Leroy's early years. We know she was born in 1850 in the state of Michigan, but we don't know the names of her parents or if she had any siblings. We don't even know her birth date. Maybe she was born in the springtime under the sign of Gemini. Geminis are very social in nature and can also be extremely fickle, both of which describe Kitty's personality to a T. Or maybe she was born in October or November and was a Scorpio. She had a magnetic personality and could be quite as intense at times, like a Scorpio. But I think most likely she was born under one of the fire signs, Aries, Leo, or Sagittarius. Like an Aries, Kitty was passionate, very independent, and willful. And she loved to perform and could be dramatic like Leos tend to be. Or she could have been a Sagittarius, like myself, as she had a strong need for adventure, but could also be a little reckless. Whatever sign she was born under, what we do know for sure about Kitty Leroy is that she was one of a kind and lived life on her own terms. And that was quite an accomplishment for a woman living in the 1800s. And Kitty lived in some of the roughest and most dangerous towns of the Old West. Still, she didn't seem to be fearful of anything and never backed down from a challenge. Kitty Leroy's talent as a dancer was already well established by the time she was 10 years old. By that time, she was dancing professionally and began performing in dance halls and saloons by the age of 14. Kitty was a beauty with long dark hair, light eyes, and a voluptuous figure. Men of her day could be rough and crude and perhaps too aggressive in their admiration for the young dancer. Maybe it's for this reason that Kitty became so skilled with weapons, or maybe it was simply due to the time and place in which she was living. In either case, she became known as a crack shot and even demonstrated trick shots as part of her performances, like her contemporary and later acquaintance, Calamity Jane. One of the trick shots her audience loved to see her perform was to shoot an apple off a man's head. But she was also skilled with a knife and could throw one at a target and hit the bullseye every time. Kitty also loved carrying several weapons with her at all times, a 
especially after she began traveling far afield, when she received requests to perform for larger audiences. At the age of 15, Kitty married for the first time. She was impressed with husband number one, whose name has been lost to time, because he was the only man in town who was brave enough to let her practice shooting apples off his head. They married, and it's rumored that they had a child together. The reason we can't be sure of this is that Kitty didn't remain in this marriage very long. She left her first husband just a short time after they wed. By this time, Kitty was in her late teens, had been performing for several years, and had become restless. She decided to seek the spotlight in a larger town. She landed in Dallas, Texas, sans husband and child, if one existed. It was also rumored that the teen bride entered into several dalliances with her male admirers before leaving her husband. She was hired to work performing at Johnny Thompson's Variety Theater in Dallas and became one of the city's most popular entertainers. Kitty loved performing and enjoyed the attention she received from men. She could be quite fickle, falling in love with one suitor one day and then dropping him for a more interesting man she met the next. But hey, she was still a teen, and we know how fickle teens can be regarding matters of the heart. It appears that during her time in Texas, Kitty had a great time dancing, dating, and gambling. She had many offers of marriage, but would remain single until the age of 20. After a decade as a performer, Kitty decided to hang up her dancing shoes. While working in saloons and dance halls, she became quite skilled at cards and made more money gambling than dancing. She began working as a faro dealer after marrying for the second time to a saloon keeper who finally got her to agree to marry him after several proposals. Faro is a card game of chance like poker, first introduced into 17th century France, but became commonly played in saloons in the U.S.'s Old West. It was around this time that Kitty gained the reputation for carrying several weapons on her at all times as she dealt cards. She also reportedly sometimes dressed in men's clothing, trousers and a jacket, while at other times wore what some described as gypsy-like outfits, the equivalent of today what we might refer to as hippie or new age fashion. But Kitty became restless again and was ready to start a new adventure. This time she took her husband along with her. They decided to travel to California to open up a saloon in the Golden State. But before they even made it to the West Coast, Kitty became infatuated with another man and left her husband for him. Husband number three wouldn't be as lucky as the first two, when he found himself on the receiving end of Kitty's legendary temper. Hey there, this is Esther from Once Upon a Crime. A big thank you to all our new YouTube subscribers. If you like what you're seeing, make sure to tell a friend and share the true crime stories. Another way to support our show and keep getting Once Upon a Crime on YouTube is to buy me a coffee. Click on the link in the description box below to donate a couple of bucks to the show. Any amount is appreciated. You will have my undying gratitude. Thanks. Kitty had been married twice and left both men for new adventure and new love. She would only marry the third time to appease a guilty conscience. Now in her early 20s, Kitty entered into a torrid love affair that was filled with passionate fighting, followed by equally passionate making up. But one argument would go too far. Kitty and her lover began arguing, and, her temper flaring, she physically attacked him. He refused to fight back, saying he wouldn't hit a woman. This infuriated her even further, so she changed into men's clothing and tried to goad him into a response. Fight me now, she demanded, challenging him to a duel. He had no intention of engaging with her, but Kitty drew her gun, believing he would do the same, but he never raised his weapon. Before he could react, she shot him, and he fell to the ground, gravely wounded. His condition deteriorated over the next couple of days, and feeling remorseful, Kitty called for a preacher to marry them before he died. He had proposed marriage to her several times, but she had always refused. Now she granted him a last wish. He died soon after the vows were exchanged. After this tragedy for which Kitty, to her good luck, did not face criminal consequences, she moved once more. This time she headed for the Dakota Territory where the Black Hills Gold Rush had resulted in scores of fortune seekers flocking to the area. 26-year-old Kitty landed in the town of Deadwood in July of 1876. After gold was discovered in the Black Hills of Dakota in 1874, Deadwood's population had grown to more than 3,000 residents. Over 200 businesses opened up shop to accommodate these new arrivals. One of the most profitable types of businesses in Deadwood was brothels. Many sprung up on Deadwood's Main Street. 
Women stood on second floor balconies inviting men, many of the miners who'd come to the area to seek their fortunes, upstairs. Kitty reportedly worked in a brothel managed by Molly Johnson. She performed at the notorious Gem Theater by day and sold her services as a sex worker by night. The Gem was advertised as a saloon, but was primarily a brothel, and a very profitable one at that. It was said that the owner, Al Swearingen, pulled in between $5,000 and $10,000 per day at the Gem. Swearingen also ran an opium den out of the saloon. With the profits, he was able to pay off town officials who looked the other way regarding these illegal activities. Deadwood was known as a lawless town, where the main industries were gambling, brothels, and liquor. Murders were common, and justice rare. The town became even more notorious when Wild Bill Hickok was killed in a dispute over a poker game in a Deadwood saloon in August of 1876. Lawman Wyatt Earp would be called in to serve as the town's marshal the following month. Wild Bill Hickok, the legendary lawman, gambler, and showman, arrived in Deadwood a month before his death on the same train that brought Kitty Leroy and sharpshooter Calamity Jane. Calamity Jane claimed that she and Wild Bill had been married, but this claim has never been officially verified. Calamity Jane was also employed as a sex worker in a Deadwood brothel. She worked for her friend Dora Dufresne, the leading madam of the Black Hills sex trade. It was a common mode of employment for women at that time. Kitty Leroy did so well financially in the sex trade that she earned enough in a few months to open up a saloon, which she named The Mint. It was at the Mint where she met her fourth husband, a German prospector who had been one of the lucky ones to strike it rich in Black Hills Gold. They lived it up for some time on his fortune, but spent it unwisely, and before too much time had passed, they were low on funds. They began arguing frequently, and when Kitty's temper flared, people could get hurt, as we've already learned. This time, however, at least her husband escaped with his life, although he did sustain injuries when she hit him over the head with a wine bottle. Ouch. Kitty threw out husband number four and promptly sought a divorce. Kitty Leroy had become a well-known character in Deadwood as both an entertainer and a card sharp. She won many more hands than she lost while dealing poker or faro, and many believed these wins were not always come by honestly. She may have been cheating at cards, but she was such a skilled player that no one could prove it for certain. She won back the fortune she'd lost with her fourth husband while running card games at her saloon. She also opened up a brothel on the second floor of the saloon and now worked as a madam managing the girls she employed. Not long after splitting with her last husband, Kitty met 35-year-old Sam Curley. Curley was also a gambler skilled at poker. Like many men who frequented her saloon, he became attracted to Kitty. Kitty bragged that she'd lost count of how many marriage proposals she'd received and turned down in her lifetime and it took a lot for a man to impress her. Most of them didn't have a shot. But Sam was different. They were immediately attracted to one another and were soon spending all their time together. When Sam offered his hand, Kitty quickly accepted. They were married on June 10, 1877 at the Gem Theater. It wasn't until Kitty was truly in love and happy, perhaps for the first time, that her past caught up with her and ruined her happiness. Kitty left her first husband and child when she was still a teen to begin a new life in Dallas. However, she had never filed for divorce, and neither had her first husband. When Sam discovered that his new bride was already married and had a child she'd never mentioned, he became very upset, and they had a big fight. Sam wasn't like the other men Kitty had dated or married. He accepted that Kitty had been with many men and was even involved in sex work, first as a prostitute and then as a madam. But he trusted her, believing that, like himself, she wanted to build a life of stability based on love and commitment. When he discovered her deception, Sam felt completely betrayed. He left Kitty and Deadwood behind and moved south to Denver, Colorado. Kitty was devastated. After Sam departed from her life, she became even more short-tempered, unhappy, and prone to acting out violently. She not only constantly wore her revolver strapped to her hip, but also began hiding a bowie knife inside the curls of her hair. She became menacing to patrons whom she now distrusted and frequently accused of trying to cheat her or her girls. She'd then pull out a revolver or brandish her bowie knife, and the room would quickly clear. No one crossed Kitty when she was in a mood. Unhappy and missing Sam, Kitty reconnected with a former lover. They were seen canoodling together at the Lone Star Saloon and soon moved in together. 
word of this got back to Sam, who was now working as a faro dealer in Cheyenne, Wyoming. Sam had never gotten over Kitty, and now became angry that he had been so quickly replaced in her affections. He hopped on the first train back to Deadwood. He arrived in town on December 6, 1877. His original plan was to surprise the lovers in the act, even booking his ticket under a false name and donning a disguise. But his nerve failed him as he could not bear to see the woman whom he was still desperately and hopelessly in love with in the arms of another man. Instead, he sent word to Kitty's lover. Sam wanted to meet him face to face. The man refused, which enraged Sam even more. He became desperate to hear the truth from Kitty and had a note sent begging her to meet him at the Lone Star Saloon. Kitty was wary of meeting with her estranged husband, knowing his temper, but she couldn't deny that she still loved him and wanted to hear him out. Perhaps he'd come to tell her he still loved her, that he didn't want to lose her and to beg her to reconcile with him. It was what she wished to hear, hoped to hear, but didn't quite believe would happen. Even so, she agreed to see him and arrived at the planned meeting on December 7th. Kitty arrived at the Lone Star and made her way upstairs where Sam had taken a room. Just moments later, patrons heard screams and two gunshots. Soon after Kitty entered the room, Sam pulled a revolver from his holster. Did he ask her any questions before shooting her? If so, did she have time to respond? That's something that can never be answered. Kitty died as a result of one bullet wound to the chest. After shooting his true love in the heart and watching her fall dead to the floor, Sam Curley pointed the revolver at his own head and pulled the trigger. He was killed instantly. The local paper, the Black Hills Daily Times, sent a reporter to Deadwood to cover the story of the murder-suicide the next day. He wrote the following account. Quote, The bodies were dressed and lying side by side in the room of death. Suspended upon the wall, a pretty picture of Kitty, taken when the bloom and vigor of youth gazed down upon the tenements of clay, as if to enable the visitor to contrast a happy past with the most wretched present. The pool of blood rested upon the floor. Blood stains were upon the doors and walls. The cause of the tragedy may be summed up in a few words. I, in one, jealousy." End quote. Kitty Leroy and Sam Curley were buried together in the Ingleside Cemetery. In death, Sam Curley accomplished what he couldn't in life, to have Kitty all to himself. A month later, it was reported that Kitty must have known she was walking into an emotionally charged and volatile situation when she agreed to see Sam Curley. Just hours after she sent word that she would meet Curley the next day, she had a will drawn up. Her entire estate amounted to $650. She was just 27 years old. <laughs> Of course, this legend would not be complete without a ghost sighting, so here we go. Just a month after they were buried, patrons of the Lone Star Saloon reported seeing the apparitions of both Kitty Leroy and Sam Curley appear and then disappear into mist. On February 28, 1878, the Black Hills Daily Times wrote the following account of the alleged haunting in the Lone Star Building. Quote, Kitty Leroy, a woman said to be well-connected and possessed of intelligence far beyond her class, was well known to the reporter. And whatever else might have been in her life here, it's not necessary to display her virtues or her vices, as we deal simply with information gleaned from hearsay and observation. With the above facts before the reader, we simply give the following as it appeared to us and leave the readers to draw their own conclusions as to the phenomena witnessed by ourselves and many others. It is an oft-repeated tale, but one in which this case is lent more ordinary interest by the tragic events surrounding the actors. To tell our tale briefly and simply is to repeat a story old and well-known, the reappearance in spirit form of departed humanity. In this case, it is the shadow of a woman, comely if not beautiful, and always following in her footsteps the tread and form of the man who was the cause of their double death. In the still watches of the night, the double phantoms are seen to tread the stairs where once they reclined in the flesh and linger o'er places where they once reclined in a loving embrace, and finally to melt away in the shadows of the night as peacefully as their bodies, souls, 
seem to have done when fatal bullets brought death and the grave to each. Whatever may have been the vices and virtues of the ill-starred and ill-mated couple, we trust their spirits may find a happier camping ground than the hills and gulches of the Black Hills. And though infelicity reign with them here, happiness may blossom in a fairer climate. End quote. Kitty Leroy, greatly accomplished as a performer and entrepreneur, did indeed live life on her own terms. But sadly, her fierce independence and adventurous spirit were no match for the fury of a man who mistakenly believed he could possess her. The bodies of Kitty Leroy and Sam Curley were later moved to the Mount Moriah Cemetery in Deadwood and buried separately. Their plots remain unmarked. That will do it for this episode of Once Upon a Crime, and we'll wrap up the series Wild Women. I hope you enjoyed it. I will be off for the next two weeks, but we'll return with a new series on September 12th. Don't forget to get your tickets either to join me in person or by live stream for the Generation Y Podcast 10th Anniversary Live Show in Kansas City, Missouri on September 8th. Along with Justin and Aaron from Gen Y, I'll be appearing with Nick and the Captain from True Crime Garage, Charlie from Crime Lines, Josh from True Crime BS, and Bob Ruff from Truth and Justice. Get more information and purchase your tickets at genypod.com. Do you want to hear all episodes of Once Upon a Crime ad-free? You have a few options. Join our Patreon for as little as $2 a month for ad-free early release episodes and other perks at patreon.com slash onceuponacrime. Or join Stitcher Premium to get this podcast as well as many of your other favorite podcasts ad-free. Use my code onceuponacrime to get your first month of Stitcher Premium free. Once Upon a Crime is written, produced, and edited by me, Esther Ludlow. My research and production assistant is Lorena Garcia. Until next time, be good to one another.